So thank you everyone for joining us this morning. I know it's a beautiful day in Nova Scotia again today, which is awesome. So hopefully it's like that across the country. Uh, thank you all for joining us in this Coach Socialization, socialization Series. We've been doing this for the past couple of months uh, with the intent to provide a platform for coaches coaches to connect and learn from each other and learn from a variety of professionals on a variety of topics. So we're really excited to have so many people from across the country joining us. Uh, and uh, today we have Natasha with us, who is our coach and technical leadership consultant at Canadian Sports Centre Atlantic. And today she's going to be talking to us about leadership and how to inspire coaches and athletes. And, uh, and throughout the presentation, we will ask that you stick to the chat box and we might open your mics throughout it a bit to ask some questions, but at the end we'll open it up for a Q&A and you'll, you'll be able to use your mic then. Uh, but without further ado, Natasha, I'll let you take it away. Thanks, Kirsty. Um, and I just want to thank everyone for joining us online. It's nice, you know, to start the day um, and get to chat to so many coaches. So it's, it's really awesome to see you guys all online. I love the little thumbnails, see where you guys are. Um, in your homes this morning. So I, I do love that. Thank you for, for joining. Um, so my plan this morning, I love this socialization series and idea. Um, so I'm going to talk on the top topic of leadership today, but I'm also going to ask you guys lots of questions. So uh, like Kirsty said, if you're happy with the chat, we can, you know, use that. Um, but I'm going to ask a couple questions throughout my little piece. And I would love if you're comfortable unmuting your mic and we can get some conversation going. Because um, I see myself today, you know, this is, I'm not here just to talk to you guys. I would really like some conversation and we can learn from each other as well. Because there's, there's so many great coaches online. I recognize some of the names. Um, and for those of you I haven't met, nice to e-meet you online, I guess. Um, so I'll start off and, and also I'll share as I get going. I have, uh, let me know if I get behind on my slides. I'm flipping back and forth between my notes and the slide on the, on the screen. So Kirsty, maybe you can give me a heads up if it seems like we're, we're disconnected here. Um, so I'll start with a little background for any of you that I haven't gotten to meet yet in person. Um, I have been away the last year. I have this book bag that I have on is filled with a one-year-old uh, who's asleep right now. So hopefully he stays calm. But um, I've been with the, the Canadian Sports Centre in different roles since 2010. Uh, so I started with them in 2010 as a full-time snowboard coach. So that's where my background um, comes. I've been coaching for 20 years now, which seems ridiculous because it just doesn't seem like that's possible, but this would be my 20th year coaching. Um, I started in gymnastics and then I transitioned. I, I spent 10 years coaching gymnastics and then transitioned to coaching um, snowboarding. And then I've also coached uh, baseball and Canada Games, a Canada Games round of softball. So kind of varied experience with getting to lead teams, getting to lead uh, individual sport with both male and female athletes, which was snowboarding. And then the world of gymnastics, I had an all-female team um, for years. And then, so within that time, I've, I've coached full-time, I've coached part-time, I've coached contract, um, and I run my own snowboard club now, So I, and that's a volunteer tier role. So it's been neat over the last 20 years. I, I hopefully have seen um, lots of varied places and, and tried to be a leader in many different spaces. So with that said, I'm just going to scroll down for you guys. Okay, can you see that whole, yeah, you can see that whole quote, right? No. Kirsty. It's, it's a little like squished. Oh, there it goes. I can see it now. Hopefully everyone else can. Can everyone else see? Okay, I'm seeing some nodding heads. Okay, weird. I'm I'll have to just you guys let me know if you can't see the full It was thing. just a bit delayed to like focus, but but it's fine. Oh. Now. Yeah. Strange. <laughs> okay, just a sec. Can I do that? Did that change at all? Is it still okay? Yeah, it's good. Okay, phew. <laughs> um, okay, so I just wanted to frame up uh, leadership in the way that we're going to talk about it today, and I really like this, this quote, uh, which was from a Forbes article, but it's, leadership is a process of social influence which maximizes the efforts of others towards the achievement of a goal, and the reason I like this specific um, definition, I guess, for sport is because this is what we do as coaches, right? So all of our, our coaches are leaders and they're trying to be a positive social influence and work towards the achievement of a goal, no matter what level you're working with, right? So our community coach, you still have a goal either to bring the team together or work towards something and then up at the high performance end. So uh, with my snowboard, 
hat on. I was, I was often traveling around the world with young athletes working towards the goal of making an Olympic team. It was still the same job as a coach, working with those athletes um, and trying to get them together and working towards a goal. So that's what we'll talk about this morning. And I guess I'll just leave each slide for a second. Can you see it now, Kirsty? You guys can see it? Okay. Um, so how I'm going to start off this morning is, is talking about this. So the fact that leadership experiences can create learning. And then really my belief is that to be, you, you first you're uncomfortable and then you grow. And I'm sure you've heard that lots before, but I'm going to talk through some of the experiences that I have had that have created learning um, for me. Hopefully some of them you've either had before or for those of you that are maybe earlier in your coaching career, hopefully they'll help you. Um, and really my belief that if you're not uncomfortable, you're not growing and that can be used in so many different ways. But, uh, you know, if we want to continue growing as a coach and as a person to seek out and find those uncomfortable situations and then be okay with doing that, being okay with taking the chance. Um, and I believe leadership takes practice and, and oftentimes the best learning is when you're in these uncomfortable situations. And um, it's why I chose this topic, because I, I can't say I'm an expert in leadership. I have no formal educate. Well, actually, I have some education in leadership, but I have no formal degree in, in leadership, um, which is why, again, this presentation will allow me to grow. So I thank you guys for that. So what I'll start with is talking through some of my experiences that have helped me uh, learn over the years. And so I chose a few specific ones so that I could talk about some of the specific things that I've learned. And I'm going to start back um, at 2006 was the first national championships that I attended as a snowboard coach. Um, and at the time, I was a pretty new coach. So I had had some, some education. I'd taken some courses. Uh, you know, I had coached a small team. I'd done a lot of instruction in snowboarding. And I had coached a lot of gymnastics. But I had never been to a national championships for snowboarding never taken a team there. So again, that's that uncomfortable situation. That first time you go to a, a big event and you're really not sure what it's like. Um, and really some of the things that I learned was, you know, being thrown into things can accelerate learning. So I was basically told very quickly, you're going to have your team start in December. You're going to build your team and you guys are off to national championships in March. And that was a very scary thought to think, okay, I'm going to put together this team and then I'm going to go to this big event. Um, but it really did accelerate. I had to learn a lot in a very short period. I had to, I, I realized that I had very little time to figure things out. So some of the things that I did to accelerate that was talk to experts. So I called the former coach and said, listen, like I can't show up at the event, not knowing what this looks like. What does it look like? What has been your experience? I called some other coaches who had never spoken before some other provincial coaches and, and asked the same type of questions. So you know, if I had tiptoed into that, I wouldn't have learned as much. It was that moment of panic that, that helped me learn so much and made me realize I need to ask people. I need to figure this out. Um, and I had a huge team attending, which also added panic because I knew I was attending. I think that year we took 13 or 14 athletes, which for one individual coach, for any of you that coach individual sport, that was a large team. So uh, typically it'd be like four to eight athletes, if that many with one coach. And this first year, again, we didn't know much. Uh, I was there with 13 or 14 athletes. It was, it was pretty much chaos. Um, so I did, I did learn a lot because of that. Another thing that I really learned in that, in that year was choosing your supports wisely. So at the time, I didn't have an assistant coach, so it wasn't that. But it was the supports around you while coaching help you concentrate on leading. So who are those people in your bubble? Um, unfortunately, what I learned was that I had chosen distractions that year. So I had to learn that moving forward, I needed people around me when I'm coaching that are helping me focus. So an example from this year was I had chosen to allow all of the parents come with their athletes and stay with us. Um, and I had also chosen some of my supports to be senior athletes who had been to nationals. So I knew they had been there and I thought they would be good supports. And really, that wasn't the best choice for me at that time. Um, at that point, those parents I didn't know very well and I hadn't set it up very well. And so they were a major distraction at that championships. Um, and the senior athletes were so focused on what they were trying to do that they weren't a good support either. They sort of disappeared once we were at the event. Uh, so I learned a lot from that time in that 
you know, I needed to structure those around me and have boundaries and set, set ourselves up for success uh, so everyone could help. Um, and then the being confident. So that's the other scary piece when you're driving into something new like this, that even though I was lost, speaking confidently and finding out what I needed to, so calling those coaches, getting all the information I could, it allowed my team to follow me and function. And I, I wouldn't say thrive at that point, but we were functioning. Um, and I do know that if I had gone on and, and let out all the emotions that I did feel, that panic and what are we doing and I don't know where anything is, um, we wouldn't have functioned and we were able to pull together and those athletes had, you know, speaking to them after they had a good experience. They didn't realize how panicked I was, uh, which is a good thing. It allowed us to get through it. So we'll fast forward a few more years where things are, uh, you know, much smoother. So I'm going to talk through a little bit about the 2011 Canada winter games. Um, for any of you in Halifax, this was an exciting one because this is one that we, we hosted. So the reason I want to talk about this one is this one had a lot of hype. So for those of us that were in Nova Scotia, like there was a lot behind these games. There was a lot of expectations as a coach, um, as a province. We had a lot of supports in place. We had a lot of people cheering us on. I've never seen crowds like this at uh, some of our sporting events. So there was a lot going on at this time. For me as a coach, this would have been, um, luckily I'd been to Canada Games as an athlete and I'd had a Canada Games experience already as a coach. So this was my second Canada Games as a coach and I had had one medalist at the first. So that's great, except I also had a lot more expectation. So this was, okay, you've coached an athlete to a Canada Games medal. We're now hosting. How many medals are you going to bring home? Um, so there was a lot going on in the background. So some of the things that... Uh, that I did to try to prepare and get through this time was planting that seed to dream. So what we did in the first game, so in 2007, we were able to get a medal because we had a phenomenal athlete who was really outside the box. Like it wasn't necessarily that we had a strong team that won medal. We had an athlete who ended up going to the Olympics. She was out on her own, a great athlete. So for this Canada Games, you know, how were we gonna get more medals? How were we gonna build a big team that could have a chance and that's why I say plant the seed to dream is what I had to do was say to the entire team that I had, and this would have been the core team about two years prior, is that we can do this at the 2011 games. We're going to host um, and we can be on that podium at those games. And in the sport of snowboarding at that time, you know, there, there really wasn't, um, we didn't do well at nationals. We, we weren't a strong team necessarily all the time. We didn't have consistent national champions. This wasn't an easy goal. Uh, so it was getting them to see that we could do it and then getting the whole team to believe because it's one thing uh, in an individual sport and this would be the same in a team sport that I've seen while coaching is that if you can get one athlete to dream that's great and maybe they'll have success but if you can get the team to dream and believe in what you're moving towards then you're going to get much more success because everyone's moving in that same direction and you've got the athletes in the individual sport it's golden because then you get the athletes pushing each other and, and striving towards a higher, a higher state. And then what was really important at this time um, was that endless confidence in my athletes. So for us, what we did at this games was we planted the seed that you could be on the podium at the games. And initially the athletes literally did not believe me. Like they said, there's no way we've never done this. We, we can't medal nationally. You know, we're like 25th at nationals. How will this happen? And what we did was make a shared plan. We were reasonable and we talked through the barriers early. So what we did was say, you can do this. This is why everyone else is in the same boat. And the athletes would say, well, we don't have the facilities. Okay, you're right. That's a barrier. How are we going to get to the facilities? Then we made a plan. So we were the team that traveled more. Another barrier. Uh, will the other athletes have a longer winter season? Okay, fair. That's a barrier. How are we going to get beyond that? And we made a plan. We traveled more. We went to Colorado. We spent weeks on end in Colorado. Um, we trained on ice. We always believed, well, the other athletes have great snow, great conditions. Well, how are we going to get beyond that barrier? Well, we're going to be the hardest team in the country. We're going to train on ice. We're going to train in the rain. We're going to train harder than any other team in the country. And then we really started to feel like a team. And we started to see that and the athletes started to see that, okay, we are. We're working harder than the other athletes. We're doing things. Uh, 
uh, that they're not doing and that, you know, that belief started to kind of to come around. Um, and it was my constant confidence feeling like there's no, you are not a different teenager than any other teenager in the country and you can do this. And luckily this really worked. And um, it's my belief that if the athlete trusts you and believes you, believes what you're saying, you're not just throwing it out there, uh, that they will perform at their best and your confidence gives them confidence. And I'm talking, so the athletes that I had in this time were about the age of 15 to 19. So that, that teenager where really that confidence is, is super important for them. And it certainly worked out for us. So at this games, we had two medalists. We had two silver medals, both a male and a female, um, out of four athletes, two of them medaled. And those athletes had never medaled at a national level before. So they literally went from somewhere mid down in the pack and they shocked everyone. And our other two athletes both came out with, um, or sorry, one of the two athletes came with a top eight finish. So it was by far the best finishes they've ever had. And, and they even said after, you know, it was, it was that confidence and that belief um, that we could all do something that they'd never seen before that helped them get there. So that was a positive story. Then we'll fast forward again the following year, national championships. Some of the things that I've learned from leading when things aren't going as well. Um, so when we fast forward to the following year, so if any of you guys have coached a Canada Games cycle, it often is up for Canada Games and then sometimes things crash again and you're rebuilding, uh, which is an unfortunate part of, of that sports cycle in Canada Games, it seems like. So what had happened is, uh, 2011 was, was great. Uh, a lot of those athletes transitioned into senior. They continued. But in 2012, I had a whole new group of juniors that we were building back up. So this was uh, younger athletes. We had a lot of like 13 to 15 year olds um, off at their first national championships. Um, I had finally gotten an assistant coach. So we were bringing a brand new assistant coach out to nationals, which can always be interesting. Um, and I had this new group of very young athletes. So what I, what I learned that was interesting was that we had brought on a highly technical, very well-respected um, athlete who had just transitioned to being a coach, and they had all of the knowledge you would want, like all of the technical knowledge you could want. Um, what was lacking was the personal connection and the empathy with the athletes uh, and the, the, the want to really connect with the athletes. So it was someone who was there to coach and give a very – in the box like this is how you do it and then at the end of the day that coach wanted to check out and uh, kind of put the athletes over here and do their own thing and what it really showed me was that the empathy and understanding of the athletes is important above all else so what we quickly learned was that the athletes value that personal connection with the coach and respect of the athlete more than technical knowledge so things really blew up at this national championships. And, and, um, and that's what happened is that the athletes were very upset. Um, they didn't feel that there was a connection there. They didn't feel respected and they didn't want to perform and they didn't even want to train. They got to the point where, you know, really they weren't feeling the, the love, we'll say, um, and they really shut down. And, and what it showed me was that I really thought they were more interested in the great technical information and knowledge and really what they wanted was connection and someone to work with them personally to support them to believe them um, so that last line it, it showed me uh, in this experience that trust and connection will lead to performance before just having a great technical background um, and having that knowledge so it's empathy and connection with their coach that's more important than anything else in a lot of the situations with these young athletes, especially. I don't know, again, like if this would translate the same to a senior level athlete who's had vast experience, but this was certainly what happened to me again and again after this with the younger, younger age group. Whoops. So I'm going to talk through one more uh, quick experience and then ask you guys some questions. Um, so the last one here was uh, World University Games in 2013. And this was a totally different experience for me uh, for a few reasons. So one, it was an older age group, which I love working with university age athletes. If any of you guys have had the experience too, it's just a lovely age group. Or I, I feel some people maybe not feel that way, but I, I love that age group. They're going through a neat time in their lives. Um, so that was really cool. It also meant I was uh, over in, in Italy with the team for almost a month. So there's nothing wrong with that. That was lovely. It was a great experience. 
Um, so I was here in the capacity of team lead for Canada for snowboard. So uh, in this capacity, I wasn't directly coaching. I was leading the team of coaches and the medical staff. So I was responsible uh, for being the leader and pulling uh, the team, the coaches, the medical staff all together, getting everyone to Italy and back, organizing uh, our space and our world when we were there. Um, so what was interesting that I got to see was that uh, the, the first comment there, age has nothing to do with leadership ability. I'm not saying it has nothing to do. Um, I guess it has, it can have little to do. So the reason I wanted to talk through that one is, is what this experience showed me is that there was certainly much older coaches that were there that were not seen as leaders and were not leading their team. Um, and things were falling apart around us where we were so lucky with Team Canada um, I was there as one of the youngest team leads at the time, um, and I was younger than any of our medical staff or our coaches, but they, they came back to me afterwards and said they had such a great experience, and, and I had the chance to reflect and go, you know, I was terrified. Like, I was terrified the whole time I was there. Am I doing this right? Am I leading things right? I'd never been to World University Games. It's a massive event. I think it's the second largest event next to the Olympic Games. Um, constantly questioning myself, and the reflection afterwards, you did a great job. And I sort of had to reflect on that myself and say, why did that go so well? Like, why was it great? What can we do in the future? And what it came back to was clear, consistent communication. So it was me constantly, probably because I wasn't sure if I was doing it okay, um, but being very clear and consistent with communication running up to the event during the time we were there. And then I had the unique opportunity of listening to the coaching staff and, and catering to what their needs were. So it was a really cool time for me to see um, if I'm able to step back and not coach, you as the coach, what do you need for support? What could help you in this time? And they really valued that and saw that as a great leadership trait, whereas I saw it as, I don't know what I should be doing right now. Hello, how can I support you? What would you like? Um, and they said that was one of the best things that I could have done as a leader. So it's interesting reflecting and going, okay, that's great. If that helps and helps drive people to success, that is something you can do as a leader. Though at the time, you know, that's not necessarily what my intent was. So that was a very, a, a great thing to do. Um, and then now allows me when I have either assistant coaches or when I'm working with my club, with my volunteer coaches, I'm, I'm often saying to them, what can I do to help support you? When we're running an event, I run a lot of snowboard events still, um, before the event, that's the biggest question that they, they now wait for is what can we do for you to help you during this event? What's going to help you coach and concentrate on what you're doing? What can I take to help you do that? So if any of you are especially head coaches and have the ability to do that or assistant coaches, and you can help assist uh, the, the coach that is working with your team ask that question, what can you do to help them? And, and what can you take on and have a shared role in this? And that will help everyone. And then the other thing um, I learned is just that creating a team when short on time can be difficult, but can also be fun. So uh, we were able to, we had two languages. So we had uh, one part of the team was mostly French speaking and another part of the team was, most, was all English speaking. So uh, how do you mend those? We had two weeks with the athletes really together. We had two different teams, but each team was together for two weeks. What can you do when you're short on time and you need to bring together and create a team? And some of it came back to just having fun, that over-communication, and especially with the two languages, it was like we were just constantly communicating with both sides of the team, getting them to understand each other, and then having fun with getting them to understand each other uh, with that language barrier. And then, um, you know, ceasing the opportunity given and, and making it fun and saying to them, like, listen, we have two weeks together. Let's have the most fun that we can have. Let's perform and be great athletes, but let's have dinner together. Let's make sure we hang out in our rooms together. Let's go for walks. Let's see things. Let's, you know, create a bond. And it's cool to hear later that the athletes are still speaking to each other from that time. When you look back, that's like seven years ago, and some of them are still friends. So that's pretty, pretty cool to see. So what I wanted to do is open it up to you guys um, and just ask, so again, either chat or if you're comfortable unmuting, Kirsty, if you could help me with that. Uh, yeah. What's a coaching experience that's taught you something as a leader? 
give you guys a few minutes to think. And then, yeah, if anyone would love to share, I'd love to hear. I'd love to hear. And I'm sure your other coaches would love to hear too. Yeah, please feel free to unmute yourselves and share or type in the chat box. Um, in the meantime, though, Natasha, we did receive like one question just yeah. about your kind of coaching context. So for softball, were you coaching just females? Or was uh, it? Yes. So okay. for softball, yeah, I was. And then coaching. snowboard was both. Yeah. Okay. That was yeah. the main thing. Yeah. Snowboarding, I always had a mostly male team. Uh, with a few females, softball was an all-female team. Baseball was an uh, all-female team. Yeah. But I have coached, yeah, lots of both. Uh, is it okay if I follow up on that question? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that you said was that trust and, com and communication will lead to performance. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really the root of my question. When you found that to be true, was that mainly in relation to girls or were boys part of that as well? It's just yeah. other things I've heard lead me to think that girls are certainly, you know, into that connection before performance. They are, yeah, yeah. And there is a, the, uh, the great model that shows that, that female athletes need a strong connection before they'll perform. Um, and males need to perform, yeah, or sorry, have like success and, and success in doing that to drive their performance. But with that said, no, feeling that connection and feeling the confidence has happened with both male and female athletes. I would say with the female athletes, it's easier. So you can dive into a personal connection with them. And if they really believe you and trust you, then you'll get performance easier. But with the males, what we saw is that when that, that um, connection didn't exist, we still weren't getting performance. And when that trust wasn't there for the athlete or for the, the trust wasn't there between the coach and the athlete. And we saw that play out a couple times. we still weren't getting performance from the male athletes or we weren't getting consistent performance because yes. males have emotions just like females do. <laughs> and um, especially young male athletes. We saw a couple times with 13 and 14 year old male athletes who didn't feel the coach was in their best interest. They certainly could not perform. They were too distracted by that thought. Okay. Thank you. Did you have any differences in terms of how to make those connections with the boys compared to the girls? I've coached primarily boys competitively, but girls mm -hmm. recreationally. I'm looking more for the boys in this question. Um, yeah, I mean, really, I spent more, I tended to spend more time with the boys creating that connection. Like the girls, um, they like each other, right? There's that social aspect. So the girls, again, in some ways it was easier in that as long as they had the social connection to each other and then I could chime in and be a support, uh, they were okay. Uh, the male athletes, I'd spent more time on one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so they were fine hanging out with each other as well, of course, but I had to spend more time getting to know them a little deeper, like one-on-one. -on -one. The girls, I could jump into the group and kind of, it was fine. But the males, if I sat down and I had a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations about, you know, what do you need? Um, how are you feeling? What do you need in competition? And I really had to kind of help draw it out of them to help create those, those connections. Um, and then over time, I did see that the best for me uh, I was always the head coach of the team, but having a male assistant coach really helped me so that we always had both and we were able to, to both support them. And sometimes our male and female athletes needed different people at different times. And we learned that that's totally fine. And it was the best scenario for us. Perfect. Thank you. Does anyone else have any more questions at this point or is anyone going to share an experience? I know you've all had experience, like these coaching experiences help us learn. So is there anything that anyone has seen or done or have you, you know, jumped off the deep end and learned anything that you want to share? And I can't see the chat. So Kirstie, you'll have yeah. to help me. Um, there is one question and one comment. So a question sure. uh, back to coaching different genders. So what mm. suggestion do you have working with a team of both genders? Uh, my, yeah, my suggestion is just, they are different. So treat them differently. So like I was saying with the female athletes, um, they need the social connection on the team. So the worst time that I ever had was when I had one female athlete, it did not work. It's very hard to retain one female athlete in a team of male athletes. Um, they're missing that social connection side that is so valuable for them. So try to always have two or more, which isn't always possible, but that helped with success, um, giving strategic time for the females to have their social time. 
And then also uh, really for me, like at a practice, for example, I would work with them differently in that the females, I would bring them together over on a feature. So I was a freestyle coach. So we would work, if, you, if anyone knows what slope style is, we'd be in a park and there's multiple things that we're working on skills on. So uh, with the female athletes, I would keep them together and it was very non-competitive in, in training. So I would say to them, let's all work on plank skill. And then they would all work together and support each other. And it was very like happy, happy, high five. Yay, we're all doing this. With the male athletes, we would move over on a different feature at most times. And it would be, okay, guys, let's play a game of skate, which is a competitive game where they get to kind of one up each other. And we would do it that way. And, and that seemed to be where I was getting the, the best experience was allowing the boys to compete more often and push each other. Um, and they didn't need the social time at the start. So I could also get them moving a lot faster, which was great. Like we would get to practice and it would be, okay, let's warm up. Guys, let's go up here. We're going to be doing this. Let's get going. And they were happy. The girls, it was, have your chat. Let's get comfortable. How are you guys all doing today? Let's get up. And then we could move forward. Um, yeah. So there, there definitely were differences, but we were able to always work on both in the same place at the same time. Does that answer whoever asked that question? I can't see. Uh, they haven't said anything yet, but <laughs> I'll let you know. And then okay. the, the comment was just that athletes, and for that matter, coaches don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So Yeah, yeah. totally. It's, uh, it's amazing, though. Like, yeah, you hear that, and it just continues to play out in so many different um, contexts. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'm going to keep going, but if anyone has anything they want to share, please do. Um, okay, so what I wanted to share with you guys, uh, let me know if anyone listened to this podcast. So I, great, or webinar, pod, no, I think I said webinar, but I believe this was actually a podcast. Um, so a great podcast I recently attended with Pat Lenosini, or Lenosoni, I don't really know how, but he's written some great books that a lot of coaches really love. Um, and he came on to the learning show with Ryan Hawk and did a great podcast. And what he was speaking about was three actions for leaders in a perilous time. So I want to go through that. It's really cool if you guys haven't listened to it um, because it's COVID specific and he's talking through general leadership. So a lot of his background is as a business leader, but um, the things that he speaks about work so well in sport. And at the end of the podcast, so it's, it's, I think it's a little over an hour. It was a long listen, but it was really good. I've listened to a lot of podcasts so far in the last two months during this time. And this was my favorite. Um, at the end of it, he has some questions posed to him from some, uh, from some coaches. So he has a couple pretty high profile basketball coaches from the U S and some other coaches ask him some questions and he talks about how these things tie into sport. So highly recommend. Um, but then I'll also share with you guys some of the key points that he talks about through this because it was, it was so great. So the number one thing to help you guys, so he talks about these three things that we can be doing as leaders, as coaches during this sort of COVID period or any tough time that you're going through. And the number one thing he spoke about was being exceedingly human. Um, and this again ties back to that trust and that connection that you're feeling. So what he said, and it really spoke to me, was that in this time, we need to demonstrate your concern for the very real fears and anxieties that your people are experiencing, not only professionally and economically, but socially and personally. And I believe that this is so important with our athletes and with other coaches. So those of you that are working with a coaching team, um, how are you showing up to that team? And how are you showing up as a leader, as a coach with your athletes? Are you showing your fears um, and talking through them? And that, that is so important in this time. And he really spoke about how that can be a difference maker during this time. So further to that, he said, you should not be hesitant to share your own concerns with your people. They want to know that they can relate to you and that they're not alone in their concerns. So again, as coaches, and I spoke about this earlier, we want to be confident, but we don't want to be blindly confident. Like we don't want to come on with our athletes and say, it's all going to be okay and we'll be together tomorrow. You know, we want to be truthful and human and show that, you know, we have concerns too, but we're going to be there for them and, their, and the team. Um, so I thought that was really important and I keep reminding myself during this time, you know, to be human, um, and to try and 
cause, you know, create that connection with people. And this is a really neat time that you get to do that because, you know, you're all in your house right now. You know, you can see things behind people that's kind of cool. And there's kids running, running into rooms and animals. It's a neat time to take advantage of that and create that human connection with both your athletes um, and especially your, your fellow coaches. Be persistent. So I found this one interesting as well, but he said during this time, and it makes a lot of sense, is it's not a time to hold back. So send people updates, reach out to people, regular communication. And even if there's not a lot of new information uh, and the message is lar largely personal, and he said this quote that was great, no one will look back at this time and say, my manager was so annoying with all of the encouraging emails checking in on me. And that's so true that, you know, maybe some of our teenage, teenage athletes may not want you constantly checking in with them, but they will feel supported. Um, so to make sure that we are being persistent and we're not leaving people alone, because again, when people are in isolation, that communication is more important than ever. So you can quickly feel like you're at home alone. And I do worry about a lot of our, our teenage athletes in this time that are home alone with their parents. You may be the only one reaching out. Like, do you know that you're not the only one reaching out and making sure that they feel connected and as part of something? Um, because it is something where, you know, I'm worried about in this time, and I'm sure some of you feel the same way. And the third thing he said, which I've seen some really cool things so far from our coaches, so I love this one, is, excuse me, is that be creative. So try new things. Um, Try things that, that can connect people. So have you tried any games or other tools with your athletes? Have you tried doing any of the, there's so many different online games right now that you can connect them without coming online and saying, we're going to talk about, you know, X's and O's, trying to find ways to bring people to, together, to be creative together um, and connect, not necessarily for a specific outcome, like not coming online just to talk about your sport, but coming online to just connect with each other. And he says that uh, crisis provides an opportunity for people to come together to know one another and establish bonds that will endure long after the crisis is, is over. And I think that's really important for us all to remember that the, the, one of the best things that you can be doing in this time is creating connections with other people and creating those deep connections. And then it goes back to the experiences that, have, uh, that I've had is that if we can create really strong bonds during this time, we're going to be in a great place as coaches later on. So those three things, again, I'll just, oh, there we go, sorry, um, is be exceedingly human, be persistent, and be creative. I think if we can remember those things, um, we're in a great place. And the last thing he said that really spoke to me, just gonna make sure you guys can see it. Can you see that okay? Okay. Um, is this is not a time to be efficient. It's a time to be present with people. And once they get that new sense of trust, then you can move on. And that, again, was just something that kind of wraps everything together and really spoke to me about what we're doing in this time. So I'm going to open it back up to you guys into some, some questions, but I wanted to ask you, and, I, and again, I really hope if you guys can, if you share right now, because this is what's going to help us all grow, is what have you been doing to connect on a personal level with your, other, your coaches during this time, other coaches that you work with, um, and what have you been doing to connect with your athletes during this time? So let's just have a very short um, sharing session. If you could even type what you've been doing with your athletes. So some of the things I've been hearing, I get to talk to a lot of coaches one-on-one. -on -one. There has been some neat group calls. So some teams have been doing some Zoom calls with all their coaches or with all their athletes. Um, I know one sport did, did one with almost 60 athletes at a time. Uh, so that's kind of neat. But what are the other things that you're doing mm -hmm. to connect? Sorry, I'm, I was... <laughs> anyone want to unmute or I'm just Tasha. type away hi it's hey, jared. jared um hi everybody my name is jared i coach artistic gymnastics in halifax um something neat that we did um originally i've been doing a lot of zoom calls with the personal group of athletes that i coach with um, but i contacted a few other coaches from another club um, across the halifax area and we actually got a group of our athletes all together in a Zoom call and we did a gymnastics based trivia. Oh, that's um, awesome. We did it on the weekend that we were supposed to have Eastern Canadian Championships. So um, the majority of these athletes would have been seeing each other that weekend mm -hmm. anyway. So we thought it was a good opportunity for them to catch up. 
um, have a little fun and, you know, just kind of express how they're feeling, especially that weekend with that opportunity not being available anymore. So that's something that we've done. That's fantastic. And again, Jared, like your athletes will see you in the future when they're older as a leader for doing that, because, um, you know, they'll reflect on this time and it'll be a positive time. They got to connect with their friends. Uh, you know, the trivia is a really cool idea talking about that. What can you do outside the box, not just bring them on and talk about their sport, but at least they were talking about their sport in a, in an interesting way as well. That's really cool. Does anyone else have anything to share? What are you doing with your athletes or coaches at this time? I see. There are a few comments in the chat box. So yeah. um, the first one was reminding coaches of this great opportunity to gain knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, another one was, I've tried Zoom gatherings with my athletes to keep them connected, but it appears that I need to lead the conversation. That, and mm -hmm. I can't get the older athletes to participate. Sadly, I'm the one feeling unconnected. Oh, that's a tough one. And I would say um, we've been hearing from a couple of the coaches that they find with the group uh, Zoom. So if you have like a team, that it tends to be about 60% participation from the team. And that's hard. And I think, um, you know, everyone's different. So within a team, for example, I'm sure you may end up with a mix of introverts and extroverts. And some people are looking for that social connection and do are okay with it being online. What I've told a few coaches too is and unfortunately there's the athletes who, you know, they didn't sign up to sport to connect online, right? Like sport happens off the computer, which I think is what's so great about it. There are some athletes struggling with creating a connection in their sport world through online. It's just not for them. It's not the fit for them. And that is going to be a group. So if it's that 40% or I'm, I'm hoping it's a little less than that, um, that group, I, I don't know the answer yet, but I think we have to be really creative on how to engage them because this is not the world for them. And a coach asked me, like, how do I get 100% online and participating in Zoom calls? I don't think it's realistic. It's not the space. We didn't sign up for sport to play on the computer, right? So we'll have to figure something out for those athletes. Yeah, good point. And a few, there's quite a few messages coming in, so I'll try and keep up. Yeah, go. Um, we created a juggling video where players pass soccer ball to one another in and out of the screen. We asked cool. parents and siblings to join in if they wanted. That's awesome. Whoever did that, that's so great. Uh, another fun. one, Zoom calls, challenge them to keep track of their active minutes for the week. We found minutes worked better than hours. Mm. Yep, that's a great one too. Very good. And little, little things like the minutes. Yeah, it's definitely more positive to track than hours. And then uh, I'm sad to say that it has been very little. Our sport ended quickly and does not normally meet in the summer. I've kept up with social media posts to try and stay current, but I think I need to do more based on the info today. <laughs> And again, for you guys, like, especially if it's an individual sport or you're not active in this time, one-on-one, -on -one, try some one-on-one -on -one Zoom calls. Um, the athletes and coaches, especially coaches, of course, that I've been talking to one-on-one, -on -one, they're really appreciating just that one-on-one -on -one conversation. Hey, how are you doing? What have you been doing? And just keeping that connection up. And then adding on to the juggling video, uh, this person Sorry, I, says, can, I can explain okay. that. Sorry. Okay, I, just, great. <laughs> I didn't know if you're going to get to it, but um, yeah. I'm not the coach for this, this particular soccer team, I'm the assistant coach. And the, unfortunately the coach has not created that time, I guess, to mm -hmm. get into this. He's a teacher and this COVID thing is getting them yeah. going online and they don't have mm -hmm. a lot of time, extra time learning new platforms. So anyways, the next thing, yeah, I asked if they would be able to get to a place where there is a basketball net. And I said, be creative, even if you're just using a Nerf net or whatever. Um, so they're in a right, right, they're in a safe place, and there's not people around them other than their family, and try and score goals. That so is they, so cool. So progressively, they you know started just juggling regularly, and then adding their knees, and then the the headers was seemed to be the easiest one to score on a on a basketball hoop. That is awesome. And we have heard from a couple other coaches that um, those challenges are helping create engagement. So some of the athletes weren't, weren't jumping in, say, to a Zoom call, but when the coach threw out like a video challenge like that or some sort of challenge, the engagement did seem to spike up a little bit. So that's really, really cool. Can I add something too? Yeah, go Zoe. 
Okay. Um, for people who are struggling with Zoom calls, what I've found is we, every Monday at 12, I'm just calling it talk time and the kids sign on if they're able to. Um, and at first I did a lot of talking and realized that they weren't responding well. So I've started doing activities and like guided conversations with them where they have to work together and, um, and it pulls them out and it's a lot better. The most recent one I did, um, I was reading a few articles about how laughter is what connects people the most right now, um, especially if it's like shared personal stuff a little bit. So we watched a quick little scientific, it was like two minutes video about that. And then we watched um, a monologue that Ellen did talking about the same thing, how laughter brings us together. And then I created like, 15 or 20, um, who's most likely to like dot, dot, dot. And it was like, some were sport, but most of them weren't. It was like, who's most likely to go to outer space or who's most likely to be a spy when they grow up or like just totally funny things. And then I would go, okay, three, two, one. And then all the kids would write one of their teammates' names down and flip it over (laughs) and then read them off. And by the end, everyone was laughing so hard and like, just doing things like that, I think, um, gets them more comfortable on the platform. So then you can have a look, like then you can have like a brief, meaningful conversation after when once they're loosened up. I would try stuff like that. Zoe, I love that. I think thank you for sharing because I can see that helping lots on the call. It would certainly help me with a team right now. That's a really, really cool one. And I love the laughter and it's cool because you're being creative and you're also showing them, you know, the human side of each other on the team, which again, is so important. So very, thank you for sharing that. That sounds really fun. Yeah, that's awesome. And for anyone who didn't have a chance to to watch Zoe's session, she actually came on last week to share the creative things that she's doing with her team. So definitely go back on her YouTube and and check that out. There's a, I think she goes over six different uh, creative activities that she's doing for athletes right now. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. There's quite a few more comments, so I'll try to get through them all. Uh, So Uh, I send out workouts on a private Instagram account and also ball handling workouts. I have the players send me their favorite combos to use as our daily challenge. At the end of the day, I send out a highlight video of all the players who are performing the combo challenge. Wow. That's that's a lot of work. Yeah. And (laughs) every day that's a lot too in this time, but if they're engaging, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. You're giving them something to do, which is great. Mm -hmm. And look forward to. Yeah. Um, Okay. I haven't tried it yet, but I got an idea from the podcast Learner Lab to hold an anti-talent show where everyone picks a skill they don't know how to do and we give them a week or two and then everyone showcases their new skill. Could be more, could be sport related or just for fun. I love that. That's a really fun one. Thank you for sharing that one. It would also motivate the athletes to work on a skill they might not know how to do yet, especially if you're an outdoor sport. Um... I do weekly challenges with my athletes and one week is sport guided and the next week is something different like scavenger hunts. I invite family to join into all the activities and then they report back in on our weekly Zoom call. That's awesome. And I'll share with you guys too, like even um, Kirstie and I's boss, Ken, he's been inviting in our families to do some social things on some Fridays and that's really appreciated. And again, that scene is something great as a leader to be able to speak humanly to your those that you're working with and include their families because family Mm -hmm. is such a big part of, you know, our lives. So it's great to see that recognized. Okay. I think that was, we got through them all. Yeah. (laughs) All right. I'm not going to keep you guys on forever. So I'm just going to flip to the last thing I want to ask everyone Um, just to reflect, you don't have to share, but this is one to reflect upon and Pat talked about in the podcast. And then um, I've heard of it a few other times during this time with all the things I've been listening to. And it's so important is how do you want to be remembered during this time? So like with the work that Zoe's doing and, and some of the others that have shared is, you know, you want to be remembered in a positive sense. So, and also you want to be remembered by your athletes. So if you've totally checked out and left them on their own, they're not thinking about you, you're not going to be remembered. Um, But if you're having fun and you're making them laugh and you're connecting with them, those are the great, great opportunities. And, you know, I got into coaching because I had a fantastic gymnastics coach from a very young age who really connected with me and, and always wanted to know what I was doing and 
you know, she made me laugh and she made, she taught me a lot about herself. Um, and then I wanted to be just like her and that pulled me into coaching and showed me that she was a great leader. So think of those things during this time is how do you, how do you want to be remembered and what do you want your athletes thinking about you? And it's a cool time to do this because a lot of the time when we're coaching, we're too busy to think about this and we're thinking about what's coming up next and what do we do and how do we get our athlete moving forward? And we can have this time to just stop and say, how do we want to be remembered? And, and what do we want our athletes to say when we get back about you as a coach? So I'm going to kind of leave it there. Um, if you guys have any questions, I'm certainly going to hang out online. And I just want to, again, thank you guys. Thank you for those that shared, wrote comments or spoke. Um, thank you guys for joining us online. And, and I do hope you got something out of today. Go back and listen to that podcast. If you have an hour to spare, you know, put it on while you do your dishes, do whatever. Uh, but it was a really good one. Awesome. Thanks so much, Natasha. And thank you for everyone for joining us this morning. We did get a couple of questions in the chat box uh, that I just wanted to hold off till the end. So, um, so this person said they agreed with the importance of social connection for girls. As a female coach, any tips about retaining the respect of the older male athletes? Their skill level may currently mm -hmm. supersede ours, even if we played at a higher level before. Oh, 100%. So I'll share that I very much lived in that world. My athlete's technical ability would surpass mine by the time the athlete was 14 for males. Um, because I was coming from a sport where the difference between male and females is like vastly different. Um, so it's true. I had to work very hard on that respect. And really, it came back to being consistent and demonstrating that you can be the support they need. So not pretending that you knew more than them, maybe technically, or that you could do. Like I always said, there's no way I can do that. I'm not going to be your demo person. I am not flying off a 50-foot jump and performing a 900 when the girls at the Olympics are not, right? That I will die. Um, so I would find ways to use other athletes to do demos. For example, I used a lot of video. And then I would be very honest with them in that I understand the biomechanics, the physiology that goes behind this, and what needs to happen. I can be your eyes, you know, the athlete can't see what they're doing necessarily. So I can be your eyes, I can point things out in video, and really gaining their confidence in that I had a lot to bring to the table. Um, there's also things, you know, even the, the top athletes in the world, they're better than their coaches technically. There's, there's no, uh, co co the coaches would still be playing otherwise, right, in most cases. So I would often point that out too and say, you know, a coach is here at that level, a coach is here as your support system. And we would talk about one-on-one, -on -one, how can I be the best support for them? But I won't say that it's easy. There are also egos that tend to step in. Some of my much older athletes, like when they were in their 20s, once in a while an ego would step in. But I mean, I took athletes all the way up to the that male athletes to the junior world level, World Cup, um, big international events. And if I had created a strong enough connection with them and they understood that I was there to help and I would do anything I could to help them get better, then I didn't have any issues. Okay, great. And one more question, or maybe more. I, there's a lot of comments in the chat box. Okay. Um, okay. Do you have any suggestions or tricks in having uh, like girls and boys work together as a team? Um, I don't know. I didn't, I never really had any issues. Like my team was, was pretty good about always getting along. I mean, we train together. So I think, does this, maybe this person could type for me um, if they train together and travel together. Cause for me, as long as we were doing that, they, they seemed to get along well. We always did do a lot of group things to make sure that we, we, I, I treated it much like I would like my softball team, the individual athletes that were male and female so that we did have that feeling of team. So we always used to come up with team agreements. Um, we always had like each of my groups as they aged out, we had a team name, like, we had slogans and they, that brought them together. So one year, for example, they named themselves, um, what was it, Mohana, like family. And so we would always come back to that, like we are a family. And that really, I, that year, or that year, I think there was three years with that group, that helped them because even when they weren't getting along, they would laugh and bicker and say, oh, we're brothers and sisters, we're just like family. Uh, and that really helped them together as a group. But 
think with every group, it's different. You're going to have to kind of find a way to bring them together and find their thing. Awesome. And yeah, they didn't, they didn't follow up yet. Um, oh yeah. They said yes, that they did train together. Yeah. Boys. So I think that helps a lot because they're in the same environment. So how can you um, have them have fun with each other in the environment? Um, sometimes with the, especially with young athletes, you have to create reasons to have connection. Like we used to take them camping every summer, uh, which, you know, you need a lot of coaches. There's a lot of checks and balances that need to be in place to do that with the males and females. Um, but do things that are outside of their sport where they get a chance to connect. So an example, the reason we did camping was give them a lot of time to hang out, cook together, um, sit around the campfire and play music and roast marshmallows and, and really bring them together. And then ensuring that the females and males aren't naturally separating and hanging out on their own, like trying to mix the groups and have them do things together. Great. And another question, where does having perspective fit in with leadership? Uh, that's a good question. And maybe this person can help me um, with some more detail on what they're looking for. But, you know, part of it is that experience. So do, like, we need to have perspective in what our own experiences are. And, and those experiences are what make us leaders. Um, so to have that re uh, reflective perspective of what we've done, and that's where we're coming for, and that's going to drive what we're doing in the future. Um, is that what that... I'm not sure exactly what that person's. I'll let you know if they, yeah. if they follow up in the chat box. But. And I mean, of course, with performance, we have to have perspective as well. Like I was saying earlier, we can't, uh, you know, an athlete who is not ready, I'm not going to tell them they're going to, let's, let's aim to win nationals this year. So you have to have good perspective of, and an understanding of where people are. Um, so that also is a piece of leadership in that you have to, um, you have to understand and be honest with people. Okay. Makes it perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, in regards to the podcast guys, I will be following up from this presentation with an email. So, uh, I'll link our YouTube and I'll also include any references that Natasha mentioned. So yeah, I'll send you uh, Pat's think, link so okay. that you can include that. Yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Great. So any last questions? The other thing to everyone online, you can always reach out to me directly. I do work for the center. I'm in coaching. Um, it's what I do. So you can fire me, fire me an email. Um, and actually, I found how to get to the chat with all my screens up. So I'll throw my email into the chat. But you can always feel free to fire me an email if you have questions or just want to connect. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us this morning and thank you to Natasha for a great presentation. Uh, I saw someone made a comment about lots of notes. Me too, okay. uh, which is great. Yeah. Um, so thank you again, everyone for joining us this morning and especially to those in BC. That's wow, really early. Good for yeah. you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, and tomorrow afternoon though, it will be a bit later for you. So hopefully we'll see you there as well at 3 PM tomorrow. We're going, going to have Jack on here. Uh, who is a provincial coach, but also a national rugby coach. Um, so he's going to be providing a bit of insight of what he's been doing to keep his athletes engaged during this time. Um, so definitely check that out at 3 p.m. tomorrow. And if you aren't available, all of these presentations are recorded and posted on our YouTube page. So uh, definitely check that out as well. And Jack is fantastic. Yeah. So hopefully you guys can pop on. He's very engaging. And yes, 3 p.m. Atlantic time. So in, in Nova Scotia. Right. All right. Thank you, everyone, and hope to see you tomorrow. Have a Thank good day. Thank you, guys. See ya. Bye.